From its early years as a mass spectator sport, football results and football comment have been strong selling points for newspapers, especially the local press. Newspapers like the East End News popularised the personalities, analysed the games and encouraged local loyalties and local involvement. But alongside reports for supporters, there have been reports about them. The reverse raised the crowd's feelings and cries of Buck up Millwall rent the air. Things began to look ugly at the conclusion of the match. Not only was the referee baited, but a large stone was thrown at him, which struck a lad on the hand. This is not the first time this season that the referee has met with a discordant reception at Millwall. Missile throwing and other notes of discord, including foul language, pitch invasions, demonstrations against officials, are all recorded from the early years. Right up to the Second World War, behaviour which would now be severely punished was an expected part of crowd exuberance. That's right, there's no time to waste. Foxall agrees and promptly repeats the dose. Beating both Ward and Watkin, he drives home a beauty which leaves Hooper helpless. Assistance is again at hand, but it's all got to be played again. Result, 3 all. But even so, Millwall had a poor record. The club was punished by the Football Association on no less than six occasions between 1927 and 1949. A game against Bradford in March 1934 was described by Ted Houghton, writing for the Sunday Pictorial. He told how, after the game, a crowd of nearly 4,000 strong assembled. There were shouts and catcalls, and the crowd began to chant, We want the referee! The News of the World had only a small report, but it spoke of exciting scenes and free fights between players on the pitch. Afterwards, the crowd refused to leave the ground, demonstrating against the directors in the stand. Mud was flung at the windows. But in court the following Monday, the authorities were tolerant. The magistrate described it as a case of overexcitement. The local papers criticised the scare headlines in the national press. Nevertheless, the FA closed the ground for two weeks. In November 1938, the club was fined. The New Cross crowd threw squibs, crackers and the rest as the players left the field. There were some occasions when uh, Millwall crowd got a bit obstropolous and uh, let the referee know what they thought of them. And I can remember one match with Bradford City when Millwall won 6-1 where uh, one of the players actually threw, uh, one of the spectators actually threw a bottle at the goalkeeper. Uh, so uh, it's not just football hooliganism today, uh, it happened then on occasions. Post-war, the pattern remained the same. The morons of Millwall have done it again. The last football league club to have its ground closed was the Lions. After an interval of 13 years, the chopper has fallen again. As so often before and since, the local reporter, closer to the actual events, had his reservations. The South London press did not refer to the matter. That was precisely how important the event looked to me. Had I said anything at all, it would be that the FA should find more efficient referees. Two years later, yet another referee became the target of fans' abuse and was assaulted by more than a hundred supporters outside the ground. Again, the den was closed. But even the national press commented on the game rather than the incident. The football supporter was expected to be noisy and boisterous. Apart from good football, a feature at the den is the lion's roar. These supporters rise at the crack of dawn on match days, have a goggle, and are so articulate that they ought to be allowed in the ground free of charge. There were 42,000 fans at the den when third division Millwall paid host to their West London neighbours, Fulham. While, as usual, the small boys were passed out of the front before they passed out. And when Millwall appeared, even the old Kent Road rocked with the cheers of their supporters. All over the country, football saw huge crowds in its golden era of the post-war years. Crowds that seemed more orderly than pre-war. ...kicked off for Fulham, who straight away went into the attack to avenge that 1937 defeat by the Lions, who then reached the semi-final. Cheer up, Missy. There's no score, yet. Millwall forced a corner and certainly gave that Fulham defence some anxious moments. But Fulham scored first. Macaulay centred, and left-winger Campbell made no mistake.
Then Millwall, a goal down, just swarmed into the attack. Fulham were content to scramble the ball away. The dangerous home forwards are supposed to prefer hard grounds. No wonder the Fulham fans spent the whole week hoping for rain. The second half, and still it's Fulham one up. They say the vocal support of the den is worth a go to the Lions, but though there was plenty of this, Millwall just couldn't confirm this report. But although it remained a mass spectator sport, by the mid-50s, those crowds began both to decline and to change. Many men with the secure jobs in the booming economy were finding that the car and the home offered a more comfortable way of spending the weekend. By the time ITV came along in 1955, two-thirds of all households owned a television set. But the Football League was reluctant to allow matches to be screened. They believed that the publicity and the fees it would bring would not compensate for the loss of spectators. Nonetheless, television was to become the main way in which people watched football. Partly in response to this new media exposure, the game was becoming more international and more commercial. It tried to move up market and aimed to be more of an entertainment. Supporting traditions, which have always involved crowd disorder, were thrown into sharper focus. Now the younger groups began to stake out territory they saw as their own. By the early 60s, the tradition of the ends was established, with their songs, chants and rituals. And they caught the ready eye of the press. By the 1960s, the popular press was becoming more competitive, more graphic, more determined to pursue stories which would instantly grab the attention. Now, the relative prosperity spreading to the working classes included working class youth. The newspapers reported the spectacle of these young men and women with their expensive clothes, their musical crazes and their free time, with a mixture of horror and fascination. A demonology of youth was built up, Ted's, mods and rockers, and, of course, football hooligans. A dummy hand grenade thrown into the gold mouth at a Millwall match was just one of a series of incidents eagerly reported. Oh, what a sad Saturday afternoon. It was another raw, ugly, painful and sad day for league soccer, lamented Sam Leach of the Sunday Mirror, while the newly launched Sun led the way in scare headlines. Press overreaction was now making it increasingly difficult to assess reported events. Flying fists and bottles marked the end of Millwall's unbeaten league run at the Den. Plymouth fled the Den last night with a smashed motor coach and shaken players. With the incident after the Plymouth match in 1967, a press vocabulary was being established, which labelled all football supporters as subhuman, crazed and thuggish. The club itself had already identified its younger supporters as troublemakers and had punished them by intermittently raising the entrance fee and threatening to ban them altogether. Now there were regular stern warnings in match programmes. Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen and boys. The irresponsible acts of hooliganism by a bunch of youngsters continue to be a matter of grave concern to us. Please don't let your enthusiasm make you do such ridiculous things as running onto the pitch. These hooligans must be stopped. Millwall was forced to act after a highly disputed incident in which referee Norman Burtonshaw claimed to have been struck by Millwall supporters. Similar incidents had happened in the past, but the mood of the times was different. In November 67, the first cages went up at the den. <laughs> 